Hi. Um, this is supposed to be a, a GIF file. Oh, okay, it works. Uh, sorry, I'm not familiar with the PC, but how can I put it full screen? Very important for this project, the idea of reflecting on the process of making. That's why it's important that designers are also here in the sense that we have tried to combine theory and practice, like physical work with conceptual work, um, as for example, uh, theories of material thinking and critical making uh, are nowadays kind of exploring, really. Also, reflecting about the very limits of this way of collaborating, because there are many intersections, but there are also limitations, and in a way, often as well, that we are speaking different grammars, like, uh, and we have different very different ways of looking uh, at things. Yes, uh, but the GIF is, uh, so at first of course I thought of showing you uh, like my, my work, my design works that I did for the exhibition, but then I realized that it's, it would be completely meaningless because the works are actually here, you are all already familiar with it. So actually um, uh, here are, uh, all of these images are found images from the internet and they uh, are here to illustrate the ideas that I'm talking about, the ideas behind the, like the concept and design elements. Uh, examples of various design inspirations and examples of fonts and etc. Uh, so I will start by... Sorry. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, so I, I'm gonna start with the general approach, but, but as I, I know Francisco for many years already and we have worked together previously, I will open up uh, with a small uh, reminiscence, and which is, I think, uh, the first time when we worked together was uh, an exhibition that Francisco did in the former ECA um, gallery, and it was on the Baltic station, the market on the Baltic station. And the concept of the exhibition was rather similar with the, the exhibition that we're having right now, which is basically that each artist uh, went to the market, both or took an object from there and then and, and exhibited in the gallery space. And uh, <clears throat> my task as a designer was to make a poster for it. And uh, like by the, the standard way of working is usually for designers, I guess, that you just sit down and you start playing with fonts and uh, images, shapes and colors and etc. Uh, but for me this approach was very frustrating and nothing seemed to work or make sense. So at some point I just shut down the computer and went to the actual market, uh, looked for an object, I bought one, which was an old uh, Carlson on the roof uh, foam doll, which I actually remember from, from my own childhood. And uh, for the poster I presented an image of the, of the doll and just put the title uh, you know, over there. And, uh, and uh, that made sense, that worked for it. And uh, <clears throat> uh, so in that sense, these two exhibitions are, I think, are very well like linked to each other. They have a similar approach. Well, of course, at some sense, also very different depending on the angle. Um, but uh, when I was starting to design this exhibition, I was faced uh, perhaps with a similar uh, design problem or a, um, what's the word, like frustration that how to link the uh, approach or concept of the exhibition with the graphic design. And uh, I started, uh, because I had already been in this situation, then I started thinking about, uh, in a similar way, like what would I do as a designer if I would be an artist, I'm sorry, what would I do as an artist if I, as a designer, would have been invited to this exhibition so thinking of in the lines of what do what do I find interesting in, in everyday objects and and uh, as a basic coincidence I'm very interested in vernacular design which means the the everyday the the mundane design uh, the design that is often done by amateurs um, design which at times is naive uh, uh, it verges into bad taste and uh, uh, plays with silly or falls into silly cliches, cliches. Uh, and it is design that is often like overlooked and uh, even disregarded by professional designers, a kind of a, like non-design. Mm. And my interest in this can be summed up by a quote from John Cage, 
Uh, it's a bit of an old quote, a uh, worn quote, but, but still very much on point. The quote is about noise, and it's, it goes basically something like this, that noise is something that uh, frustrates us when we try to avoid it, and it's something that fascinates us when we draw attention to it. So in that sense, when I'm talking about, what I am talking about is, is design noise, basically, uh, and by this I mean, of course, the, the, the background noise or the ambient, the design that surrounds us all the time, that is always there and has become so habitual, so peripheral in, in the sense of uh, perception that we don't even notice it. Mm, for example, uh, a sign of a local beauty salon, salon or a beauty parlor, uh, it's an object that we encounter every day but almost never really notice it. Uh, even when we look straight to it. <clears throat> uh, and if you think of this, if you take this into consideration, into consideration I hope that the design of the exhibition starts to make sense. And I will now uh, talk about the different elements of the design in, in more detail. So the first thing I think is the fonts. And uh, in this exhibition I have used three fonts. First of them is the, uh, a font called CSC Champagne. The second one is Times New Roman and Trade Gothic. And all of these fonts are very widely used uh, in vernacular design. So the CAC Champagne is, of course, this, uh, the beautiful script font that is used for the title of the exhibition. It's a font made in the 90s by an American greeting card uh, company. They, they commissioned it for their own use. It's the same one on the welcome, welcome sign. And it's a, it's a licensed font, meaning that Basically, you'd have to buy it, but uh, there are many free copies uh, in the internet fronting around. And basically, if you Google the font, there's not much information about it, only basically the year and the fact that it's commissioned by a greeting card company. Uh, but you will immediately have like 10 or even more links where you can very easily download the font for free. And for that reason, it's uh, very widely used. I mean, of course, it's not widely used only because it's very accessible, uh, but also I think it's a very beautiful font. Uh, it, it, depending on the kitchen, uh, sorry, depending on the context, it can work into it can work into a kitsch or uh, be very elegant. Uh, and uh, just three days ago, actually, I by accident went walking in the Baltic Station Market. I noticed it on a car uh, where it was used for a logo for uh, uh, Villa Nova. Mm, and this, imi uh, uh, this image is somewhere, somewhere here rotati rotating as well, and it's the only image made by me. Ah, here it is. That's the job. <coughs> the second font <coughs> is uh, Times New Roman, which I guess next to the font Arial is the most overused font in the history of font kind. And, uh, uh, and in some cases, it's still the default, default font of many text editing softwares, and uh, that's the reason why it's used so many, so so much by vernacular designers. Or, or uh, I think uh, it's uh, uh, it mostly pops up on various signs and and uh, notice boards where people who are not designers have just they need. They have a message that they have to tell you, for instance, that these carrots cost that and that much, and so they just use the first font that comes up. Uh, and the second font, ah, oh, sorry, and I used, uh, I used this Times New Roman for the body text of the newspaper, uh, also for any, any other longer text in the exhibition, but, but the font originally is also made for a newspaper, uh, the Times, of course, and uh, I, I really like this small link to it, that it's, it, so to speak, in its right place. And the, the third font, the Great Gothic, is also an old uh, newspaper font. It's used in the titles of the newspaper. <coughs> and uh, I like the contrast between uh, the three, three fonts, which are all from, from a, which are all a different type of font. For instance, the, the Champagne font, which is like a beautiful script font. Uh, then uh, Times New Roman, which is a, a serif font and uh, Trade Gothic, which is a sunset for a grotesque font. And uh, uh, this reflects, in a way, our contradicts of plays with the modernist uh, dogma. I don't know if you're aware of this, but they have the statement that only one font is basically sufficient, uh, preferably a sunset font, and the most preferably, I would say, Helvetica. 
And as a side note, every time when I hear this uh, modernist statement, it reminds me of uh, a paraphrasing uh, of this famous uh, rhyme from the Lord of the Rings saga, uh, where this, this rhyme is about the, the one ring. I, I, I like to, I mean, it's a joke by philosophers, sorry, uh, by designers to uh, make this uh, rhyme about the font, the modernist one on, and only font, which is the one font to rule them out and in the darkness find them. Uh, <clears throat> and I chose this uh, pluralist approach to fonts, mixing them together, but, but also I didn't want to do this in this uh, postmodernist sense as opposition to modernism, which uh, nowadays, in my opinion, is also turned into a kind of cliche, which would be this very visual, very straightforward experimentation, stretching and cutting up different fonts and putting them together as much as you can, but in a sense uh, like a subtle, subtle uh, opposition uh, breaking the rules, but not just for the sake of breaking them, I would say. <clears throat> and this also avoids that the design doesn't turn like a re retro design, like being referencing something like 90s design or so. Uh, the, uh, next, the font, the second element is uh, ornaments, <clears throat> and of course the oval round shapes. And uh, here again, Mm, you can already guess, you can already see from the references that this is derived from the beauty parlor designs, mm, trying to look very floral, referencing even the Jugend style or Art Nouveau, and uh, if you will, like a feminine, feminine way. <coughs> mm, and uh, again, as a side, night, side note, besides the ovals, the design has no straight corners uh, in general. Each rectangle is made into a soft and friendly uh, object, uh, shape, uh, which again is a common trope in vernacular design. It seems that small businesses are very afraid of looking angry or, or God forbid, sad. So they want to look, so uh, by uh, uh, trying to look friendly, they quite, quite often overdo this and instead of looking just like decent and smiley, they, they turn out to be uh, uh, like over the top hilarious. And uh, of course, <clears throat> Our seminar is also uh, very friendly, as you can see the smile in the, in the bottom. Uh, and uh, to come back to the ovals, they, they come in two senses. First, of course, is the ornamental sense, like the flowery leaves. And uh, the second is in a, in a symbolic or a metaphoric sense, which is the big oval, which is on the posture and in the middle of the newspapers, which is like a metaphor for the mirror of the beauty parlor or perhaps the shape of the, of the signs. <clears throat> And the third thing uh, that needs some attention is the newspaper itself. Uh, I guess this is already obvious, but a newspaper, mm, uh, the, the, for, the newspaper format basically, to, to choose this as the publication of the exhibition, is itself a very mundane object. I mean, like a newspaper is a very mundane, everyday object that we use every day. And uh, uh, we, I chose this big, uh, the huge format. Uh, to emphasize this, the objectness of it, to make it more, uh, I mean, to make the interaction of with it uh, not like some kind of a small, small booklet or a flyer, uh, but something that you have to handle, you have to, you know, fold it constantly, perhaps, and sit down to take the time to read it, and um, by making the interaction with, like, by not making the interaction quick and easy, uh, you draw more attention to the medium or the material of the, the thing. So in conclusion, uh, the, de the design elements are re derived from vernacular design and in the spirit of John Cage and I would also say Francisco Martinez. And I uh, here invite you to pay attention to the objects, in this case uh, design objects around us. And uh, peripheral design objects, habitual design objects, design objects that we usually don't even notice design objects that are taken for granted and in the eyes of uh, the privileged spectator uh, quite often are not even granted the status of a design object. Thank you. I wanted to ask uh, you about the process of negotiating or informing the design to perhaps uh, share some reflections, it has been easier or more difficult, the fact that perhaps we know each other, the fact that I am not a professional curator, in the, because we met for some coffee, we were chatting, yeah. I sent you some text, and in a way, based on this, you, you came up with this design. 
Um, well, I don't know. It's hard to say. Um, I think the, the process was rather easy, simple. I, when we met first and I showed you the sketches, uh, uh, again, I was a bit frustrated because you show, I, I showed two sketches, one that was influenced by vernacular design and the second one that played with the idea of the labyrinth, which Hannes Prax, uh, the spatial designer, designed to the exhibition. And uh, you chose the one I didn't like anymore, and I was very sad that I actually that I showed you at all because I, I think you'd made the wrong choice. <laughs> uh, but but I'm happy with it now because then I mean I just had to work with it more and make it satisfactory for myself. So uh, but but in general I think the um, yeah I don't have any deep reflections on the process. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, please question to me. Yes. Just very quickly. I mean, how hierarchical is the choice uh, in seeing Francisco as your client here on um, the reflection on his past life and his past career as a journalist and the fact that your desire for the publication becomes something that connects to his own biology? Uh, this is something that I didn't think at all, and I think it's a really nice, uh, like a touch to it, that that uh, a former journalist and now we make a journal. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a there is more than a yeah. Of yeah. In a sense, uh, although he was a curator by uh, designing this newspaper, I uh, forced him to write a newspaper article, not a curatorial text. So. Please. Uh, do you know where this kind of uh, fascination uh, comes for graphic designers to use this kind of crafty design? Yeah. Because lately I had several uh, experiences. Um, one was in Facebook, they have a group where people who like graphic design post obvious designs. And one day they posted a, a picture of a festival poster. Probably you know it. Yeah. And there were like hundred comments, how bad is it? And the other one was I visited a philosopher, a friend of mine, and he bought a poetry book, which was designed by Norman Norbert. And he said that design is so repulsive that he it's like a task or a challenge to read the poetry or even <laughs> understand the poetry so he can look the design. And I have seen it so many times, and yeah. especially popular among younger designers. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, this would take like a, a lecture in itself, I would say. But like to take your question into parts, then for instance, this Facebook group uh, is called basically. I mean, it doesn't matter what it's called, but I don't really think that. The people who post are people who like graphic design, I think are people who actually hate graphic design. Or uh, maybe yeah, it would be even right to say people who don't understand graphic design. <laughs> and, uh, but um, where does this fascination come with, with crappy design? Uh, here again, I would like to ask, like, how, how do we design crappy design? Um, that's the thing, like, you know, one would say that this is a crappy design, but I think it's very uh, beautiful. And it also depends. I mean, I, th I think there's, you know, there's not really an answer what's good or bad or what's crappy design. It all depends on the context where you present it. So, uh, of course, I understand that um, doing something very uh, crappy, so to speak, uh, uh, you know, may not work in, in some context, but in some context it works very well. But the interest uh, for crappy design, I think, uh, actually, I guess uh, one of the first starting points also comes from the interest in vernacular design, and I think it really came with like the first wave postmodernists. Basically, I mean, I don't know if you're familiar with, but with the book like Learning from Las Vegas and stuff like this, where you you go out and you look at objects which you usually take as crap. Well, basically, the same thing that I already talked about. So, so in that sense, the interest in this. This design noise, so to speak, is already very, very old, from the 60s or something like this. Uh, I think it's just, um, yeah, uh, maybe now more common, and uh, there's a little bit more of designers doing with, dealing with that kind of a uh, graphic material, so that the designers who don't really understand that kind of approach or the motives behind it are forced, are, are facing it, are, are you know coming up with it. And of course, then they post it to internet or Facebook because they are like, "What the hell is this?" But you know. But can you see it as a fashion trend, or it's constantly? It's just uh, I, I would say that everything can be seen as a fashion trend. 
and the, within this uh, like uh, school of or, or designers who are doing that kind of graphic design, I think there are designers who are doing very interesting work, and there are designers who are just you know going with the wave, like like just seeing somewhere somebody using a bad script font and then they put it as well, and this can be uh, thought of as a as a you know shallow, trendy way of doing design, whereas you know. Uh, others, I think, are doing it very profoundly and interestingly, and so to speak. So. Yeah, good or bad design is also assessed depending on how effective or not it is, which is, uh, means, therefore, the audience. And uh, one of the intentions of this project was to reach as many pe people as possible, in the sense that it was not a project by artists to artists, or by anthropologists to anthropologists, or designers to anthropologists or whatever, in the sense that it had to be tangential and reach different publics. And it was not meant only for the usual visitors of this museum, but also to extend the audience, if not create its own audience, because this kind of inter interdisciplinary project, interdisciplinary project has not been yet done in Estonia, or not, not, not often. Therefore, the idea of the newspaper, because newspaper is something that used, not, not anymore, but uh, everyone used to grab on the way to work or on the bus or, and, and, and also a sense of ordi ordinariness like quotidian everyday life the newspaper so the, we, we had discussions about the audience what is the audience what is the audience of this project of this exhibition I remember in our first meeting you asked me this but um, let's, let's invite our last speakers many thanks sorry. <laughs>